Sky News Australia presents a Prince Harry News Special. Well, Prince Harry has unleashed his most explosive claims yet. How many times can you just go back to ripping on the royal family, especially when, as it appears, they're not going to have much to do with you? You can't have your cake and eat it. He has left the royal family behind. He's living, by all intents and purposes, a very privileged, glorious life out in the Californian sunshine, and yet continuing to trash the royal family. Prince Harry's controversial memoir is proving to be a true tell-all. They're going to want him to deliver something that sells books and makes headlines. But I think the view from within Buckingham Palace and Kensington Palace is to ride this one out, to hope that this Sussex school kind of blows itself out once they've said their piece. This is not just a, a little fight or a little bit of annoyance. This is war, a declared war on the royal family. Prince Harry's once very private life, now an open book. The second son of the king dropping his biggest bombshells yet in his tell-all memoir, Spare. In some ways, he was my mirror. In some ways, he was my opposite. My beloved brother, my arch nemesis, how had that happened? The Shakespearean style rift with Prince William, a recurrent theme of his autobiography, part of a multi-book publishing deal worth more than $60 million. The pages narrated by the Duke of Sussex himself lays bare their relationship breakdown, including Harry's claim that the heir to the British throne attacked him during an argument over his wife. He writes that William came to him with claims Meg was difficult, rude and abrasive. He says his brother said she had alienated half the staff. But Harry says it was William just repeating what he had heard in the press about claims the Duchess was difficult. And that William became so angry and then allegedly pushed him to the ground. He grabbed me by the collar, ripping my necklace, and he knocked me to the floor. I landed on the dog's bowl, which cracked under my back, the pieces cutting into me. I lay there for a moment, dazed, then got to my feet and told him to get out. Any suggestion that um, there was a physical assault, if you like, against Harry by William is extremely damaging. I don't think William has any option other than to weather the storm at this point. Interestingly, he says that William was parroting media narratives about his wife. But at that point, those allegations about the way Meghan was treating staff had not been made public. So I think a lot more forensic analysis of the whole timeline of this would be interesting. Time and time and time again, Harry makes references to his family in order to really damage their, their public um, perception. And so I think that uh, once the dust has settled from, from this, it will be very difficult to see how the family can even in, invite Harry to sit down and discuss uh, th these issues with them because they've been so personal, so petty, some of them, in order to try and uh, besmirch their characters that uh, I, I think it will take a long time for them to forget that and move on. With a book to sell, Harry's executed a series of high-profile TV interviews. The first was with Tom Bradby from UK's ITV. He's told the veteran anchor that he doesn't believe his brother or father would read his book or watch any of the interviews. But he says he stands by what he has written as his truth and claims the royal family has done their own version of their story aimed squarely at him and Meghan. You've just put enormous amounts of private conversations in the public domain. I mean, wouldn't your brother say to you, Harry, how could you do this to me? After everything we went through, wouldn't that be what he would say? He'd probably say all sorts of different things. But, you know, for the last however many years, let's just focus on the last six years, the level of planting and leaking from other members of the family means that, in my mind, they have written countless books. Certainly millions of words have been dedicated to trying to trash my wife and myself to the point of where I had to leave my country. 
I think for a very private family for whom those conversations that take place behind closed doors are never revealed, this would have been deeply, deeply uncomfortable. He's gone on for years now about protecting his privacy and he has not taken one jot of protecting his family's privacy. Harry's book also sensationally takes aim at the now Queen consort Camilla. He writes that the brothers urged Charles not to remarry, claiming while they supported Camilla, they didn't think marriage was necessary. Please don't marry her. Just be together, Pa, Harry writes. He then makes the extraordinary claims that Camilla mounted a campaign for marriage and ultimately the Crown. Stories began to appear everywhere in all the papers about her private conversations with Willie, stories that contained pinpoint accurate details, none of which had come from Willie, of course. They could only have been leaked by the other person present. The Prince doubled down on those allegations in an interview with Anderson Cooper on 60 Minutes in the United States. But he went even further describing Camilla as the villain who needed to rehabilitate her image, claiming she was dangerous as she forged connections with the British press at the expense of him and William. But the Prince denied in an interview with ITV that he'd been scathing of Camilla, even claiming there's no part of any of the things that I've said are scathing towards any member of my family, especially not my stepmother. There are things that have happened that have been incredibly hurtful, um, some in the past, some current. He's absolutely scathing in his uh, personal attacks of Camilla. I mean, he calls her a, a wicked stepmother. He says that she was dangerous. She was the other woman. It's very interesting that when challenged by Tom Bradby on the ITV interview about why he'd been so scathing, he denied that he'd been scathing, yet, you know, he's calling Camilla the villain in the situation and at one point says that, you know, it was inevitable that in her PR campaign to rehabilitate her image that there would be bodies on the street. I mean, that is such a stark image. It's very hard to square away with other parts of the book where he talks about how happy he was that his father was now happy and how accepting they were of the situation. Books in these circumstances tend to be sort of like manifestos. You know, this is the chance for me to put my side of the story without anybody answering back. If you look at Princess Diana with Andrew Morton's book, Diana, um, her true story, it was true, but it wasn't the whole truth. The problem is, it's just when your father is a king of a country and the rest of your family are seen members of the royal family, it's only going to cause a divide. And I think it's just such a shame to destroy the family. I think it's absolutely appalling for Harry to have written this book. Harry's title, Spare, a reference to his role in the line of succession, is not only a story about his fractured family relationships. It's a deeply personal insight into his struggle with grief, revealing intimate and at times shocking details. Harry openly admits to his battle with drugs, smoking pot as a teenager at school, consuming magic mushrooms and taking cocaine at the age of 17. He says it didn't make him especially happy and his main objective was to feel different. He says he was willing to try almost anything that would alter the pre-established order. And while many thought there wasn't much left for Harry to say, he's provided plenty of eye-raising anecdotes too, revealing he lost his virginity in a field behind a busy pub and explicit details about his private parts. But the overwhelming and most heartbreaking theme throughout Spare is the impact Princess Diana's death had on her youngest son. This is BBC television from London. Diana, Princess of Wales, has died after a car crash in Paris. The French government announced her death just before five o'clock this morning. Buckingham Palace confirmed the news shortly afterwards. Normal programs have been suspended while we bring you the latest developments throughout the morning. This is a news flash from National 9 News. 
Welcome to this special National 9 News update and the news out of Paris on the condition of Princess Diana is not good. She is now officially reported as dead. His memoir is dedicated to her. His portrayal of being told by Charles at age 12 that she had died is deeply distressing. He describes how the then Prince of Wales sat on the edge of his bed, revealing the shocking news that his mum had been killed in a car crash. He heartbreakingly writes that Charles repeatedly called him darling boy and that his dad's voice was soft and Harry knew he was in shock. There were complications. Mummy was quite badly injured and taken to hospital, darling boy. I thought again, injured, but she's okay. She's been taken to hospital. They'll fix her head and we'll go and see her. Today, tonight at the latest. They tried, darling boy. I'm afraid she didn't make it. Prince Harry claims his dad didn't hug him after he delivered the terrible news, saying he wasn't great at showing emotions under normal circumstances. How could he be expected to show them in such a crisis? But for years, Harry actually thought Princess Diana was still alive and would reappear in a disguise. He claims William had thought the same thing. And in harrowing detail, he writes, why 10 years on, he drove through the same Paris tunnel where she lost her life and forcing himself to pour over the police files with photographs of the crash scene, realising that some of the photos of his mother in the back seat of the car were actually taken by the paparazzi who had chased her. They'd never stopped shooting her while she lay between the seats, unconscious or semi-conscious. And in their frenzy, they'd sometimes accidentally photographed each other. Not one of them was checking on her, offering her help, not even comforting her. They were just shooting, shooting, shooting. He couldn't cope with his mother's death. It's quite understandable. And here, I think the royal family were wrong. He didn't get enough support, I don't think, when it happened. The fact that he couldn't really grieve about his mother absolutely affected him hugely. Harry just sank down and down. And he told me that he, because he had to keep it all inside him and bury his head in the sand, as it were, which is that he, what he said, it, it sort of gradually ate into him. How heartbreaking those passages are from the book and from the interviews. Imagine, you know, any child of 12 being put through that heartbreak for them doing so on such a public stage. And perhaps the most shocking thing for me so far is his admission that he didn't accept that she was actually dead until he was about 23 years old. That's you know, more than 10 years of carrying around endless confusion, pain, and uh, you know inability to move forward. And I think you can only have huge compassion for him. I think it's impossible to measure the sheer impact that Diana's death had on Harry. He was such a young boy, very, very close to his mother. And she brought the fun into their lives and the joy into their lives. And to lose their mother at such a young age is just incomprehensible, really. And we know he's talked about just how traumatic it was to have to walk behind his mother's coffin. And from that young age, he has had no mother figure in his life. And I think we see that. He describes himself as being Diana's boy. And we see it in the way he operates, the way he acts with children, the, the way he is around people. He has so much of Diana in him. People deal with grief in different ways. And my way of dealing with it was, was by just basically sh shutting it out, locking it out. The 10 years that I was in the army, I just sort of dug my head in the sand and was just it was just white noise. And I, I went through a whole period of having to try and Sort, my, sort myself out. For some members of the military, though, 
the prince's revelations of what happened in Afghanistan goes too far. Saying that he killed 25 Taliban people and that he thought of them as chess on the chessboard. Now, this is extremely dangerous. He would certainly have known that this is not done within the army. You don't actually talk about numbers. You don't talk about that because you um, encourage the enemy, as it were, to attack you back. So he's now put his whole family in a very... Uh, dangerous spot. The top brass of the British Army have come out and uh, and completely admonished him, saying that it's uh, dangerous to not only his family, but his other family, if you like, the military family, the people who serve both at home and abroad. And I think that would be very cutting for Harry. The royal fallout from Harry's tell-all autobiography is worse than expected. It comes just weeks after the release of the couple's sensational Netflix series, watched by millions around the world. Harry's main theme once again was what he claims was the constant briefings from members of his family against him and Meghan. It's a dirty game. You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. So if the comms team want to be able to remove a negative story about their principal, they will trade and give you something about someone else's principal. So the officers end up working against each other. I realized that I wasn't just being thrown to the wolves, I was being fed to the wolves. I've been a royal correspondent for about 10 years now, and I can categorically say no one at the palace has ever called me and given me a salacious story about anyone, uh, more's the pity, because, you know, that would be quite interesting. As a journalist, stories don't just come from the palace. Um, that said, you do go to them and people will brief you on whether something is accurate or not accurate occasionally. More often than not, the palace just won't comment. But I don't think there has been an orchestrated campaign, at least not from my perspective. And I think it's important to recognise that there's a difference between having cordial relations with the press, having a good working relationship with the press. You there, are there, after all, to publicise the work that the royal family are doing and engender goodwill towards them in many ways and actually orchestrating, leaking, planting deliberately. Now, I would like to hear more of the specific examples uh, that he's referring to. We're not hearing exactly who said what to who and when. But I really do think he's he's completely confused. I mean, if you look at any other uh, relationship between the state and journalists, be it uh, within politics or the health service, um, then there have to be relationships between press officers and the journalists who cover that relevant beat. But uh, I think that Harry really bogging himself down with this uh, this this context that there was always briefing against him, that people were actively uh, trying to smear him and Meghan throughout the, the whole time that they were within the royal family is just um, is, is absolutely wrong. Harry maintains he tried to do things the right way, telling America's 60 Minutes there would be no point in renouncing him and Meghan's Duke and Duchess titles and that ultimately he had been betrayed by his own family. And every single time I've tried to do it privately, there have been briefings and leakings and planting of stories against me and my wife. You know, the family motto is never complain, never explain, but it's just a motto, and it doesn't really hold... There's a lot of complaining and a lot of explaining. And private being done in through leaks. Through leaks. Well, he's got no proof of that, so I wouldn't believe a word of it. I mean, you can tell uh, Prince William is a very honourable, dignified man. If you think he's going to... He's looked after Harry all his life. He's protected him and cared for him. And um, if you think that that's what he's going to do, then you're completely wrong. They're very angry about the negative press. They don't understand why it's why it turned on them. And they continue to delude themselves that if they just set the record straight, people are going to love them again. That's not how it works. The only way to make the people love you again is to shut up. If they think the media are bad now, if they think the paparazzi are bad now, goodness, they should have been around 25, 30 years ago. That was... That was the time when you woke up and you had no idea what was going to come at you. Now they've got the press pretty well corralled. To say the bits he said about the media about how he feels that it's not fair on his family, 
but yet he'll you he needs the media they all use the media because they want to get their their work out they want to get their charity work they want to get the news out there so you've kind of got to make up your mind which way it is In a deal believed to be worth nearly $150 million, the Netflix series also delved inside the previously private lives of the Sussexes with never-before-seen home video. But more of what we've come to expect from Harry and Meghan, an all-out assault on the royal family. It was terrifying to have my brother um, scream and shout at me and my father say things that just simply weren't true. And and my grandmother, you know, quietly sit there and, and sort of take it all in. Well, there can be no mistake that this is a complete declaration of war by Harry and Meghan against the whole royal family. I mean, nobody comes off uh, well at all. I mean, Harry and Meghan have called uh, William a, a, a bully. They've called the, the king a liar. They've said that the queen just sat back and, uh, and let it all happen. I mean, these are quite extraordinary allegations at the heart of the monarchy. Harry and Meghan are being paid a huge amount of money for this. And Netflix are a commercial operation. They expect a decent return for what seems to have been a very hefty fee. What they want is headlines, scandal, gossip, sensation. And Harry and Meghan, whether they want to or not, once they've entered into that arrangement, they have to deliver. I think that to do that on your parents, having done the opera, having done his mental health with opera, you know, Give, telling um, what he's heard from a brother. If he's talked to his brother, he then goes and tells and makes money out of it to some TV company um, so that, that you can't trust him. You can't build on nothing. When you are part of a family, you have to learn to live within it, don't you? I don't know how Prince Charles will manage. I don't think he could shut the door on him. But William is furious beyond rage. I mean this in the most respectful way. I've said I'm glad that the Queen's no longer around to see it because I don't quite think she would know how to kind of handle it. Some will say we feel tremendous sympathy for you. This was obviously a very, very difficult experience with you. Others will say enough now. You are extraordinarily privileged. You live a very privileged life in a multi-million dollar mansion in Montecito in California. You were raised in a palace, Harry. Stop the complaining. I accept that there will be people around the world who fundamentally disagree with what I've done and how I've done it. But I knew that I had to do everything I could to protect my family, Great. especially after what happened to my mum. You know, I didn't want history to repeat itself. I think it's a little bit glib to try and say that Megan's experience is like Diana's. They're two very different women in different times uh, doing very different jobs. Her gripe was not with the monarchy, it was with her husband. And that's a very different set of circumstances. She knew that the monarchy was going to be inherited by her son, her eldest son, as it happens. Uh, and uh, she would say to me often that, that this is not something that she would choose to damage. Diana loved the monarchy. She was incredibly proud that her two sons were going to be senior royals, that William was going to be king. You've given birth to a king. And she was very proud of them. She loved it. It just didn't work for her and the marriage didn't work. But she wasn't vicious. She wasn't trying to get her own back. Meghan didn't get an easy ride in the media. And I do feel a degree of sympathy for her on that. But we also have to look behind the scenes. There are also allegations of bullying that took place, denied by Meghan, but maintained by those who worked for uh, the Sussexes. And I think that there was a lot going on behind the scenes from a very early point. He talks about this fear of history repeating itself. Um, but I do think that the media has changed a hell of a lot since his mother's day for the better. That's not to say that they haven't suffered as a result of some of the coverage. There's no question of that. 
Well, it's one of these convenient truths for Harry, I think, by comparing his uh, his wife to his late mother. Indeed, I mean, Diana was a very, very different person. She was an awful lot younger, 19, when she was sort of brought into the royal fold. Uh, really, it didn't have that guiding hand that Meghan did have. And for, for Harry and Meghan to sit there and say that nobody helped Meghan is, uh, you know, is a complete travesty. I mean, people at the palace will say that she was afforded all the... Uh, all the help that uh, the, the Queen and the rest of the royal family could give her. I mean, she was given one of the Queen's most trusted aides. There was a team of people around her, a communications team who were working very, very hard to try and make sure that she got to grips with royal life. And when you compare that to Diana, Diana really was left alone. And uh, and that culminated in the, in the breakdown of her relationship with Charles, which became so, so toxic. And I think the lessons really were learned by the palace in that sense. And uh, for Harry and Meghan to, to play on those is, uh, is quite a distortion of, of the truth, unfortunately. It's hard to believe how things went so horribly wrong. This is BBC News with a special programme on news of a royal engagement this morning. It's been announced that Prince Harry is to marry his girlfriend, the American actress Meghan Markle. Becoming one of the most famous couples in the world, now officially to marry. It is an exciting morning in Great Britain. Take a look at Kensington Palace right there. The first look at Prince Harry and Meghan Markle now engaged. Meghan and Harry's love story had captured hearts and minds around the world. I was at the wedding. I knew Harry. What I find extraordinary is when they get married, everybody loved them. Everybody loved them. Everybody was, there was so much excitement and happiness, and it was Harry and Meghan fever. It was intoxicating. I was at Windsor, and the atmosphere was just incredible. I mean, the sun shone. Everybody was shining with delight and glee, and it was just moving. I was happy that Harry had found somebody he'd really loved because it's not easy, because he was a real star then and number one man everyone should want to marry and um though it, it it i was very pleased he found someone who could cope with the spotlight um and it was just the most wonderful day and and i thought as well megan would be fantastic for him because she's used to that as an actress i was in windsor for the wedding and there was this huge sense of love and happiness and support for this couple. Harry had been on his own for some time. His girlfriends in the past had found it difficult to deal with the media attention, perhaps understandably. And then he'd found this woman, this independent, articulate American actress who was used to being in the public eye. And everyone thought, isn't this fantastic? Someone who can modernize this royal family, a breath of fresh air. There was a real sense of joy and a groundswell of support behind them. And I think it's really sad when you think just how quickly that began to change. Here was you know, Harry, uh, a man who was absolutely adored at home and abroad, uh, a war hero, somebody who'd pretty much had a, a rough deal in life because of the death of his mother and his place within the family and a woman who he'd fallen in love with, a mixed race woman who'd had a fantastic career, a fantastic orator, kind of knew what she was getting into or so we thought, that everybody really wanted them to succeed. And I felt that people in the family also did as well. With their popularity rising, Harry and Meghan joined forces with William and Kate, dubbed the Fab Four. The younger group was seen as a modern way forward for the royal family. Do you ever have disagreements about things? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, healthy, healthy disagreements. OK, the last thing you disagreed on, how do you resolve it? Uh, I can't remember, they come so thick and thick. <laughs> but it's, but it's, is it resolved? We don't know. Oh, we don't know. Well, you're putting on a great show if it's not. <laughs> but as Harry details in his book Spare, the feel-good hype surrounding them soon came crashing down. 
the negative reports surround Megan allegedly bullying staff and claims of friction between Megan and Kate started to take hold. He claims Kate was on edge while putting her and everyone on notice that she was going to be compared to and forced to compete with Meg. From Harry's point of view, a, a focus almost exclusively on the negative. Now, that's not to say there wasn't quite a lot. And things did change. I think after their tour to Australia um, and New Zealand and the South Pacific, but I think that there's a lot more nuance to it than he's letting on. By then, the once inseparable brothers were publicly at war. Look, we're, we're brothers. We're, we'll always be brothers. Um, we're certainly on different paths at the moment, but I will always be there for him, and as I know, he'll always be there for me. You add this on top of just trying to be a new mom or trying to be a newlywed. It's... Um... Yeah, well, I guess, and also thank you for asking, because not many people have asked if I'm OK. But it's, uh, it's a very real thing to be going through behind the scenes. And the answer is, would it be fair to say not really OK, since it's really been a struggle? Yes. Crowds have turned out to welcome the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to Melbourne. Tens of thousands of Victorians came out today to greet the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. And while they tried to meet most fans, a few lucky ones got picked out from the crowd. By all accounts, this tour has been a right royal success and given the couple a platform to be the change they wish to see. So we went from this wonderful high of the wedding and the couple went on their tour of Australia. And I think that was a turning point for two reasons. One, behind the scenes, there were tensions building with AIDS, reports of furious rows uh, between Meghan and some of those working for them. But Harry has described this as a turning point in terms of the royal family's attitude to Meghan because he claims that she was such a success she was such a natural at this, that she was better at this, that someone that was born into it, that that became a problem for the royal family and the royal household, that there was a sense of jealousy uh, there because she was doing it so well and she was stealing the limelight. And he claims that that was reminiscent of his mother, Diana. There's always two sides to a story, which is the same for Harry and Meghan, it's the same boy and Kate. There's always two sides to a story. So... It's, it's, it's obviously Harry and Meghan are trying to tell their side. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to hear William and Kate's side because they will, that's what they will not do. If they all told their versions of the story, at least you'd, you'd be able to build up a picture. But, ah, that's what happened. Well, it's an interesting point of where Meghan went wrong. And uh, I think from her point, she would say that she wasn't afforded the help that she needed. Uh, she was sort of abandoned by the royal family, whereas people in the palace would completely refute that and say she was given so much help that we've given one of the Queen's most trusted aides to sort of guide her through the process of, uh, of entering royal life. And I think she sort of came into the organisation expecting it to change for her rather than for her to, to add to it. And, and that's a real sadness, I think, on both sides of the fence because, you know, there was a, a, a groundswell of support for her, both from the public and within the family and uh, and perhaps her and Harry maybe tried to run before they could walk. They, they, they spoke of the fact that there was a hierarchy within the family and uh, that they didn't fit in. I mean, it's uh, it, it's quite bizarre that they thought that considering it is a, a hereditary monarchy and uh, it's always been laid out in front of them. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have announced that they are carving out what they call a new role for themselves. In a statement released in the last few minutes, they say they intend to step back as senior members of the royal family and work to become financially independent. Move over Brexit. There is a new breakup that's shaking up the UK and it's been dubbed Megxit. The decision by Harry and Meghan to step down from their roles in the royal family is causing a stir outside and inside Buckingham Palace. So when I asked the question, Question, why did you leave? The simplest answer is lack of support and lack of understanding. Harry and Meghan's exit from the firm was laid out for the entire world to see as they sat down with the queen of the talk show, Oprah Winfrey. 
and also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? There were two key points that came out of the Oprah interview that caused maximum damage to the royal family. One, that a member of the royal family had, according to Meghan, raised concerns about the color, their baby, Archie, the color his skin would be. That was hugely damaging to the royal family. Were they a racist family? Was there institutional racism at play here? And then Meghan describing her mental health struggles, the suicidal thoughts that she experienced. She claimed that she reached out for help and she was told that she couldn't have that help. She repeated that in the Netflix documentary saying it wouldn't have looked good for the institution. Look, both of these, the Oprah interview and the Netflix documentary series are very partisan. We only hear one side of the story and the royal family don't have the same right of reply. They can't respond in the same way. And I think Harry and Meghan know that. Have you spoken to your brother since the interview? <laughs> no, I haven't spoken to him yet, but I will do. And, and can you just let me know, is the, the royal family a racist family, sir? No, very much not a racist family. But in a shocking plot twist, Harry has told ITV's Tom Bradby he and Meghan never accused the royal family of racism. A couple of things. You talk about accountability. Mm. In the Oprah interview, you accuse members of your family of racism. You don't even... Well, we well, of... The British press said that. Right. I... Did, did Meghan ever mention that they were racist? She said there were troubling comments about yeah, Archie's skin colour. There was, there was concern color. about his skin colour. Right. Wouldn't you describe that as essentially racist? I wouldn't, not having lived within that family. The narrative that a member of the royal family um, you know, cast doubt or ask questions over the colour of his future child's skin, which was widely interpreted, not just by the media, but by people, viewers across the world, and Oprah Winfrey herself, as being um, a condemnation of racist attitude. He has stepped back from that and said the royal family aren't racist, that they never said that. Now, so much this is about interpretation. And while it's technically right to say they didn't say those words, um, the inference was there. In fact, you know, they accepted an award for standing up against institutional racism within the royal family just a month or so ago. Um, so it's interesting that he's chosen now to correct that narrative. I find it extraordinary that he's now trying to say that they haven't said that the royal family is racist. Um, if that is true that they, they've never said it, why didn't they correct it immediately afterwards? This then it exploded. There was a, almost a witch hunt to try and find the royal racist. And this has continued for the last two years. At any juncture within that period, Harry and Meghan had the opportunities to come out and correct the narrative. And yet they have only uh, ever uh, remained silent on that part and allowed the royal family to be, have uh, accusations of racism levelled at them. The wounds from that Oprah interview cut deep, the first of many. Six months later, at the funeral of their beloved grandfather, Prince Philip, the simmering anger continued as the two brothers kept an icy distance. Their cousin was forced to walk between them during the funeral procession. There was some hope the relationship had healed by the time Queen Elizabeth II had passed. This is BBC News from London. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. In a statement, the palace said the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. Harry and William came together to commemorate their beloved granny. And as the world joined the royals in mourning, Harry and William seemed united in their grief. I did think that when the Queen passed and we saw the Fab Four all together again, um, I did say this is fantastic, reunited again, and I thought maybe this is a chance for them to, you know, I, I, I assumed that they'll be talking and that maybe it'd be a chance for them to work things out. And the King made that famous speech where he actually talked about Harry and Meghan, and it was almost kind of giving them an olive branch 
you know, making it clear that they're part of his family. I want also to express my love for Harry and Meghan as they continue to build their lives overseas. But things weren't as they appeared. The united front was all for show, and the brothers' once unbreakable bond was broken beyond repair. It really exposed the depth of that rift between the two brothers, and it looked at this point, at least, that that rift is irreparable. William and Harry were best friends. They weren't just brothers, they were best friends. They were, you know, they absolutely they supported each other. Um, I think they consulted each other and everything. They were really close, which is, again, why this is so sad that this is all happening. William, I think, is less forgiving, rather like a brother would be, thinks it's shocking. And um, I don't know how, if he does speak with Harry and they become... Um, you know, they can actually have a conversation that is pleasant, that he can trust him with. I don't think it will ever get back to the warmth that they had earlier. He was famously thick as thieves with his own brother for so many years. And the, the fact that Harry said that he was left distraught and damaged by the fact that he felt that his brother had betrayed him by going against him and briefing like, uh, that, like their parents did throughout that really toxic period after the breakdown of their relationship is, uh, is really irreparable. Harry revealed on Oprah and his Netflix series, jealousy within the royal family was a key cause of things turning sour. The issue is when someone who's marrying in who should be a supporting, a supporting act is then stealing the limelight or is doing the job better than the person who was born to do this. That upsets people, it shifts the balance. In his book, he writes of the friction about his father. What he really couldn't stomach was someone new dominating the monarchy, grabbing the limelight, someone shiny and new coming in and overshadowing him. And Camilla, he'd lived through that before and had no interest in living through it again. That jealousy perhaps runs both ways, though, because we also know there were reports of jealousy from Harry and Meghan towards... William and Kate, Harry and Meghan living in the fairly modest Nottingham cottage uh, on the Kensington Palace estate, while the big brother and his wife had the rather grander apartment 1A. Were they not happy to play second fiddle to the more senior uh, brother and his wife? Well, Harry and Meghan this is suggesting that there was issues within the family because they were doing the job better it is frankly ludicrous because you know, it stands to reason that, the, that William and Kate would have wanted them to be part of the family because by the very token of them not being there, their workload has doubled. They've got an awful lot more on their plate by Harry and Meghan leaving the family. Indeed, you know, William was, is going to be the king. He's the one going to be meeting world leaders, doing the statesman-like jobs. And I don't think at all he was ever interested in a popularity contest. So again, it's one of these convenient truths by Harry and Meghan that have been put forward, forward which, which uh, you know, don't really fit the, the true narrative as it, as it should be told. Harry has to make some compromise, but he doesn't want to make compromise now. I think that, you know, he's always felt William's got more than me because he's going to be king. And now, I think with the help of Meghan, which he's very pleased about, he feels he can thrash him too. He's more powerful. I think there's an element of that within his action because he knows that William um, can't come back as much as he can attack. And as the firm maintains a dignified silence, Harry and Meghan continue to air the royal dirty laundry, a tactic which could be backfiring. Incredibly, though, he's told 60 Minutes in the US he's willing to reconcile. At the heart of it, there is a family, without question. Um, and I really look forward to having that family element back. I look forward to having a relationship with my brother. I look forward to having a relationship with my father and other members of my family. I think a lot of people who like them a lot have turned away from them because, OK, you don't like your parents, you don't like the lifestyle you have, move on. They're clinging on to their own names, you know, Duke and Duchess. If they don't like the royal family, get rid of it. But they won't. And it's, um, 
it's becoming so spiteful and people are bored with it desperately bored with it i think people have had it they've had it with their fake victim routine no one feels sorry for them Start doing nice things for other people and stop obsessively talking about yourselves and your fake victimhood from your $15 million mansion with your $175 million worth of deals. No one feels sorry for you. They have very effectively painted themselves as victims. I'm at something of a loss to understand what they're the victim of. Being a royal princess, or a prince for that matter, is a fabulous opportunity to do an almost unlimited amount of good. It, it gives you the the logistical support, the diplomatic clearance, the media profile to do pretty much anything you want. And the royal household, which, as I know as well as anyone, can be a bit of a creaking old machine, nevertheless will deliver the goods. Uh, if you take the trouble to learn how it works, uh, it will give you almost anything you want. It's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, organization. Well, it's a ludicrous argument to say that you wanted your privacy uh, and to leave the royal family to achieve that in one uh, sense, and then pretty much giving your whole life, your whole family album uh, over to, uh, to a streaming giant like Netflix, who has broadcast it to millions and millions of people. I mean, the genie is well and truly out of bottle with that, and it will be impossible to row back on it. So what happens now for Harry and Meghan? Well, they are, are essentially celebrities, and that is the, the life that they will have to lead. There won't be any concept of privacy. I mean, the, the rules with paparazzi in the press are very, very different in the US to the UK, and I think that they will definitely find that. But after this latest, very public soul bearing, Many fear the once very popular royal may never find a way back into the life and family he left behind. The Windsors are not famous for their conciliatory talents. You know, they are royal people. That's different from most people. They're not used to having to compromise and compromising with each other. Not easy. A lot of work is going to have to be done behind the scenes, Harry says the door's open and that the ball is in their court. But I think it's understandable that the royal family is wary now because they know that conversations that they have may become public knowledge. We're told William is very hurt. Um, he's very, very angry. And, uh, and obviously the, the king will be devastated. You know, this is just a few months into his reign. It's his big moment. He's stepping up to fulfill the role of a lifetime and he's filling huge shoes you know this is such a difficult thing to be playing out live up to your promise of seeking privacy which of course is a lie they love seeing themselves on camera they love reading about themselves in magazines and newspapers and seeing themselves on the big screen and writing about themselves in books how do we know that because they do it incessantly but what they need to do is actually just get out of the public eye for a few years and just quietly toil away doing the works. They, they want the perks without doing the works. Where did the family go? Well, I think they, they will move forward. There, there's been a, a, a real rallying cry through the top down, through the senior royals of one of unity. They will push on with no negativity in 2023, and that will only widen the gap uh, between them and, and Harry and Meghan further. Well, certainly the people I've spoken to at Palace are completely uh, wearied by uh, Harry and Meghan's consistent and con uh, constant attacks on the family. Uh, I think that it's impossible to see where they go from here, really, in terms of a reconciliation with members of the family. I think it's gone far too far. The door is closing, I think, on the royal family, and it's getting narrower and narrower, and I think every interview they're doing, it's another, it's almost like that door gets closed a little bit further. And when the door's slammed, it'll get locked and it won't come back in. That'll be it. The thing with all of this is that there's a lot of money at stake here. There was a lot of money at stake for this Netflix documentaries deal. There's money at stake uh, for the book. They have to deliver something. But once that's done, what comes next? The Netflix deal is a multi-year deal what more will we have what more is there to say that will all have to play out over 2023 do you still believe in the monarchy yes i talk about it in the book do you believe you'll play a part in its future i don't know i really don't know